G'day everyone, thank you Julie. Um, I am a real person. I am going to take the video off now, um, as Julie said, to reduce the amount of internet we're using. So here I go. Okay, so thanks for joining me, or us, to uh, discuss native grasslands and the reconstruction and the management uh, after a fire. So after, whether it be after a fire or in any other circumstance, uh, it doesn't really change much, but um, specifically fire obviously is what we're talking about. Uh, I'm from Seeding Natives Incorporated. Uh, we're a registered charity, an environmental charity, uh, and a not-for-profit organisation that specialises in the ecological restoration of native grasslands uh, and associated ecosystems. So uh, that's me, I'm a founder and CEO, and I'm very happy to be here. So the sport, uh, supporters of um, this webinar on the screen there, Natural Resources, SAMDB and AMLR, and of course, Horse SA. So, okay, let's, well, let's start at the beginning. So here we've got a, a native grassland, um, could be any grassland, but this so happens to be one that we reconstructed. And then along comes a fire. So this is actually a fire that we intentionally uh, held for biomass removal and site preparation. But in the circumstances of the Cudley Creek fire, um, it was probably considerably hotter than this. And the temperature of a fire will make a big difference to what it does to the biomass, what it does to the grassland, what it does to the seed soil, uh, the soil seed bank, um, and all, obviously the trees and other things as well. So you end up with a burnt paddock. Uh, now there's, there's lots of things regarding uh, a burnt paddock that cause us issues. As you, you would all know, I'm, I'm probably telling you some things that, or talking about things that everybody knows, but I must speak the obvious. Now this particular, this particular picture here, I'm not really interested so much in the effect of fire on water repellent soil, but it was the only thing I could really sh uh, the only picture I could really find that really showed the fact that you've got before anything's burnt you've got this layer of grass you've got a layer of whether it be weeds or grass pasture salt bush it doesn't really matter what it is you've got a layer of something and then the fire comes along and then you've got a layer of nothing you've got ash you've got uh, soil that has been totally cooked um, at the same time, if it was a if it was a nice cool burn like the picture we saw before of of us doing a burn, um, you haven't necessarily lost too much other than the green on the plants. You probably haven't lost too much in the way of weed seed, uh, which is an interesting thing when it comes to the rain and then all of a sudden you're completely covered in weeds. But then at the same time, if it's been a really hot fire, you would have cooked the weed seed which in a way is a really good thing because when you're putting in a native grassland, it's the weeds uh, that you want to try and get rid of. So if, I, I thought we might have some technical difficulty, but we'll get there, hang on, there we go. So um, bear with me everybody, this is the first time I've, had, I've been on a webinar. Um, so hopefully everything goes smoothly, but nonetheless. This is a picture that what this is meant to be representing is this is after a rain, um, and sure this isn't a paddock, but it's similar enough. Where it says water infiltration and you've got the grass, there is absolutely no water whatsoever sitting on the soil. It's all infiltrated, it's all gone into the soil layer. When you don't have any biomass, you don't have any grass or anything on the ground, it just sits on the surface. Sure, it does go in, slowly and it does make its way through depending on the clay content the sand content sandy loam all that kind of thing but the big point here is when there is no vegetation the water hits the surface and either pulls or if you can imagine if you're on a slope that just runs off and as it runs it takes the soil with you so if we add to that um, we add hooves so it doesn't really matter what, what animal it is, we just add hooves to the situation. So whether it be, let's just speak about your paddock because that's what we're talking about today. Um, it doesn't matter if it's flat ground or 
if it's slopy ground, those hooves on the ground that has been burnt are going to be disturbing the already ash surface. And what's going to happen when it rains is all of that is just going to flow off. So you're going to lose your topsoil. All the ash is going to go down to your dams or to the river or to the, um, to the creek or whatever it is. And this is just a good example of what water will do. Uh, this wasn't meant to be um, a creek or a river, like it kind of looks like it, it has turned into. Uh, that was just purely from erosion after a fire. Uh, and that is because there is no biomass, there is no grass or vegetation on the soil surface to hold everything together. And then along comes the wind. And we have seen this time and time again. Uh, we see it all the time. It's something that takes our, you know, our soil goes to Victoria or whichever direction the wind's blowing. Uh, and it travels a long, long way. It, the most important thing is it's leaving your property and going to somebody else's. Uh, and that's the last thing we want. The, the topsoil is the most important part uh, of, of our soil system. You've got all your microbiology that goes deeper as well. You've got the whole range of reasons why you don't want this to happen, obviously. So one of our primary focuses after fire is soil stabilization. Um, obviously feed, uh, that's what we want to do is get as much green grass and vegetation back into the paddock or back into the area so that you can get your horses on there as soon as possible. But we know that that's taking a long time, um, especially when you have a fire in the middle of summer. We did have some rain, but you know, we greened up in some areas, but that's majority we gone by now. Um, but soil stabilization, if we don't stop the soil, soil from disappearing, uh, we've lost nutrition, we've lost, we've just lost the depth of soil um, and the, the top layer is really important. Here is a, um, a picture of basically a cycle. So if you have a look at the, the top picture, sure it's not a paddock, but let's just uh, have a look at it as the fact that it's all green and it's looking fantastic. The fire comes through, absolutely decimates it on the next la level down. The layer underneath that is a few months later. Then the layer underneath that is another year later. And then underneath that, we're getting down to basically what it was before the fire. So you give it a couple of years and everything comes back. That same thing happens majoritively, not only in um, sclerical forests, so eucalypt forests, it happens in almost every scenario, even in a paddock. You do lose certain species completely from fires, fire sensitive species. Native grasses are, um, pretty good when it comes to fire because if a, if a fire tears through a paddock and you have native grasses in there, um, you can just about almost guarantee that your native grasses are going to come back. Sure, if it's too hot, they won't, um, but you'll have some seed in the seed soil, um, in the soil that will, you know, again, it rains and it all comes back. But many tussocks and the root systems of native perennial grasses are very deep and most of them can come back really well from fire. Uh, okay, so on, what we're going to do is we're just going to cover some of the, you know, some of you might know a bit about native grasses, but we're going to cover a, a whole thing, a lot of stuff about native grasses and what, what you need to do after fire. So there are two different types of uh, growth cycles. You've got the C4, which are the summer species, and they're the ones that like growing when it's warm. They're the ones that are all green out there now. Uh, you, you won't find too many of the cool season grasses flourishing right now. I mean, even the summer grasses are struggling a bit because we need some rain to keep them going. Um, but at the same time, it's starting to cool down, uh, especially at night time. And that is slowing down the summer grasses. And now it's time for a bit of rain and the C3 uh, or the cool season grasses. Now, the reason they're called C3 and C4 is to do with the photosynthesis. So it's not important. Um, they just are referred to C3 for cool season grasses and C4 for warm season grasses. All right, so warm season native grasses. So you will probably all be aware of uh, grasses like kangaroo grass. And the height of kangaroo grass can vary. You know, you can have something that is as high as, you know, one and a half, 1.6 metres tall, or you can have it as low as half a metre. It just depends on uh, the variation of, uh, of the species. Here is another picture of the kangaroo grass. Um, beautiful for horses. I mean, we know all of these 
well, at least I know, and I'm here to tell you that all of the native grasses are great for horses. There are cycles of horses when it comes to nutrition of horses. There are cycles of, in the uh, life cycle of grasses, not horses, of grasses where the nutrition changes, whether it be the time of day, whether it be the age of the plant. But generally speaking, all the native grasses are great for horses. Um, next we go into, we're still in the summer grasses. So don't forget summer grasses, windmill grass. Um, you've probably, most of you have probably seen this on your properties. Um, it's very shallow rooted, but it's amazing how just a bit of rain in summer and bang up it comes. Curly windmill grass, uh, enteropogon, uh, fantastic grass, uh, usually grows in the drier areas on the uh, on the other side of the range, kind of the direction I am, which is uh, the Manum direction. Um, but you do find it, you definitely do find it uh, on the flats and in the northern parts of Adelaide. Um, and it's really good for um, surviving through drought. Bottle washers, everybody would probably be familiar with this one. Another fantastic uh, summer grass. I'll move a bit quicker through these, but look, look, at, the, look at the leaf on the cotton grass. Um, fantastic for horses, grows really well you get some rainfall when it explodes and away it goes. Same with the Paspalidium uh, in this picture. This picture is actually from one of our seed production areas. So this is one of the ones that we grow for um, direct seeding. And it's an absolutely fantastic grass, um, for horses, for, for a whole range, of, um, whole range of reasons. Wallaby grass, everybody would know with the wallaby grasses. So we're, we're down to the C3s now. So this is the cool season grasses. These are the grasses that are now, as soon as it starts raining, they're the ones that are gonna green up. They're the ones that are germinating um, and taking us right through spring and uh, right up to summer. The C3 grasses, the cool season grasses, do still stay green in summer. It's just their primary growing time uh, is the cool season and they kind of shut down when it comes to the uh, summer. There's another wallaby grass considerably taller than the first one. Spear grass, uh, you'd all be familiar with that. I'm sure you've had it in your socks or potentially in an animal. Um, I would suggest that uh, you would normally not be having the animals in a paddock uh, at the same time that the spear grass is ripening. Uh, once it's dropped and has screwed itself into the ground because it naturally um, drills itself into the ground uh, with a bit of moisture, it twists and drills in. Once that's occurred, no worries. You can, animals can go in and graze the, graze the grass. Elegant spear grass, um, this one looks like it's got, when the, it's got a bit of uh, the sun comes through when it's, it's got little drops of moisture on in the morning. It kind of looks like it's covered in diamonds. I think that's where they get elegant from. Weeping rice grass, microlina. Another fantastic one for horses and one that people, most people will already have in their paddocks um, and one that is fantastic to add back in again. There's another picture of it. I mean, look at, that's just really beautiful and leafy. Please ignore the um, Yorkshire fog that's popping up in the front there. Um, fantastic grass. Okay, on to reconstruction. So this is where we, this is where we want to uh, completely restore, or we want to sow in a native grassland, we want to put in a grassland. Uh, the same theories apply that we're going to talk about right now. They do apply to um, just doing a bit of patchwork and you know, extending a bit of a grassland area, but this primarily is to, to put in a native grassland after fire, um, after fire or no fire. So what we're looking for here is all year round grazing for your horses. Um, obviously management comes down to it as well, but with the most grasses that we have in the paddocks now, especially after the fire, you're gonna have the annuals are gonna be going crazy. So we all know that the annuals aren't good for the horses, but not only that, they die at the end of uh, spring and you've just got bare paddocks right through until it rains again. That's not good. That's, none of us want that. Um, you're feeding your horses all the time um, and then you're having to lock them up in, in winter because there's, uh, you're getting laminitis and things. Not good. Um, this is a diverse native grassland that we have sown previously. So it's got lots of flowering herbs in it and things like that. Still perfectly um, great for horses to be in here as well. Um, I, 
could be just a little expensive to be adding in the flowering herbs and things and then intentionally putting horses into it. But they would love it. Um, I don't know that you'd want to do it though. <laughs> it could be a bit pricey. I'm just throwing this in here. So when we're putting in a grassland and you're wanting your horses to have something that's, that's good for them to eat, they're not just eating the grass. I mean, sure they are, but the grass is part of a system. The grass is, I mean, you look at this food web and you think, well, wolves, we haven't got wolves, eagles. It's just a demonstration of a food web. You know, you've even got the things in the soil. Everything is interrelated. So when you've got the grasses growing and then the insects that are in there and the microbial action, everything that's happening underground, you've got the birds that come in and feed on it. You've got the insect, you've got so much happening that we don't see, but it is vitally important. It is really, really important. You've got all of these things that are not, not only great for the environment. So these birds, a lot of these birds are actually threatened. The goanna there is the Rosenberg goanna, which is threatened. They um, thrive on grasslands. But the fact that you've got, and that cute little guy at the bottom, that's a um, southern brown bandicoot. Um, they, they, sorry, I've just got to add this in. They pretend that they're dead um, whenever they get too close to, um, to people. So he's actually pretending. And then when he got put back on the ground, he just took off. Anyway, back to it. Um, so it's really important to actually think about the fact that you're not just putting in grass, native grass, you're actually, actually putting in a whole system. And the soil, what I was talking about is on the right hand side there, you've got some soil that's not too great. Um, these two samples were actually taken not too far apart, but the management was completely different. The one on the left hand side that's got a lot of organic matter, it's got a lot of carbon in there. That's actually a really nice looking soil. That's, that's got you know, a lot of nutrition and a lot of life happening in there. And that is because it had perennial native, or sorry, it doesn't matter if it was native or not at this stage, perennial grasses on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, some clover and annual grasses. So it didn't build the soil. The perennial grasses, they suck the, um, they put sugars into the ground, they put the carbon into the ground, it gets sucked out of the atmosphere and into the ground to build your soil. Um, this is just another native grassland with flowering herbs in it. Another grassland in a vineyard. So all of these are actually ecosystems. Um, and this one, the horses would just love to go into this one, but unfortunately the, uh, it gets, once a year it gets grazed by sheep. Um, but this is a, a fantastic example of uh, what took us two years from the beginning of site preparation to the time that it uh, was sown. And then a year later we had this and that's, almost up to your knees with uh, native grasses. Uh, another example, this is a raceway. They actually ended up planting trees in here for a bit of a windbreak. Um, and that on the left hand side is mainly uh, annual grasses and on the right hand side is the perennial grasses. So we're gonna get to a how to in a second, but I'm just showing you a whole heap of different versions and varieties of what we're, what we're talking about. Okay. Here, I haven't had dinner, so that actually was really yummy. Um, so when you make a sandwich, you start at the bottom. You start at the beginning. It's put, you put the bottom bit of bread on. If you don't put the bottom bit, you go to pick it up and it's just gonna fall all over the place. It's the same thing when, you, when you're building an ecosystem, you're building a pasture, you're building something, you start from the bottom. You start with what you've got on the ground and then you build it until you end up with a complete uh, an end product. Same as, let's have a look at this. These guys are building a road. If they didn't put down the gravel first and compact it and have the preparation right, you wouldn't be able to drive a truck on it. The road will be falling apart in six months and it'll be a complete and utter waste of time and money. Although it looks the same, if they have done the base underneath well or not well, the end product looks the same, but then six months or a year later, it's not, it will fall apart. It's the same as a native grassland. It's the same as ecosystem reconstruction, environmental work. You've got to start from the ground uh, and right from the beginning. So that is with site preparation. So the weeds, and you'd all recognize some of these lovely weeds. Um, the weeds themselves aren't important. Um, it's the fact that we need to get rid of them. If you want to sow native uh, grasses, uh, into something that's full of weed seed of these species and every other species that you can think of, they are going to be competition and they are going to be something that are fighting against the natives and especially like the ryegrass and the, um, you know, a whole 
Phalaris as well. We know Phalaris is just uh, terrible for competition. Um, you need to do your best to get on top of the weeds before going ahead with the native grasses. So the fire, um, so I, I see, let me just go back for a second. The fire in some cases has completely cooked the seed, the weed seed of the species that we're looking at and many others, completely cooked it. In other circumstances, it has glazed over the top and hardly removed any. So the paddocks have had a lot of their perennial grasses, if they had any, they're completely gone, they're bare. When you've got a bare patch and it rains, you're gonna get weeds. It's as simple as that. When you've got perennial grasses and you've got an existing pasture, the weeds are, are minimized because you've actually got existing tussocks and grass in there. But then when you've got nothing after a fire, and it rains, you get everything under the sun that's, that's in your, uh, the weeds, they all come up. So what we need to do is get on top of some of the weed in the, uh, in the soil. So you can see here there's the seed in the soil, whether it be sitting on the top, which hopefully could be cooked by a fire, but then you, as you get deeper down, you know, you might get down to an inch and that might be what is generally speaking going to, um, going to germinate within a year, maybe within that top inch. But you go and disturb the soil and you're actually, um, you're getting all of the, the weed seed is being disturbed, which is encouraging them to all germinate and you get a load of, a load of um, weed seed. So in sowing a native grassland, you need to have the weed seed bank as minimal as possible. The competition for natives uh, when they're growing, they, ju they just don't like it. They're, very, they're a lot slower than all the weeds and they get outcompeted. So here we go, this, the depth of soil. So let's just say a fire has come across and it has burnt the top and it's burnt, let's just say, the top five mil. We've still got soil in the 10, 15. So all of that weed seed is still going to come up, even though you might have had the fire go across the top. You might have a germination of weeds and then you come through and you go and through and spray them. There's a lot of weed seed that's still sitting in that soil that hasn't been um, encouraged to germinate. So there needs to be some kind of soil disturbance to encourage them to germinate. Now, after a fire, um, we've got this, this very, this surface that is uh, erodible. The, the water can make it go away, but uh, erode down the, down the hill. We can have the wind come and blow it away. So it's a tricky thing that go from site to site, you'll be deciding, or with our help or with anybody else's help that knows what they're doing, you'll be deciding what the best thing to do is in your specific search situation. But generally speaking, you need to get that weed seed in that top 10, 20, um, mill in here it actually probably could be centimeters but that's not the point it, it's just the fact that we really need to get that weed seed out of the soil by encouraging it to germinate and getting rid of it basically okay so the most important thing for native grassland establishment so being your pasture is the weed control if you have seed and and you know that's relatively easy um, you, you buy it or you grow it or you take it off the the plants that you found on the back corner of your property and you you have even if it's just a handful of seed no matter what you're doing it could be 50 kilos on a paddock it could be a handful on a little corner in the you know it could be in your backyard just so that you can grow some more native grasses it's all about the weed control so how that weed control uh, un is undertaken that's one thing uh, and, and obviously a very important thing but just the fact that you do it is really important so if you're doing 10 square meters or 20 square meters you might pull everything out by hand uh, that might be the easiest thing but or if you're a keen gardener and get out there all the time for sure but when we're talking about on a paddock scale it's not really feasible uh, in this case we're actually burning uh, for site preparation. So the idea was that we were going to be uh, burning the weed seed. So not only burning the uh, the biomass or all the, the exotic grasses and the weeds, but we're also going to be burning the weed seed. 
Now, what we found from this was that it didn't burn the weed seed. Sure, it might have burned a little bit, but because we opened up the landscape, uh, it actually encouraged more weeds to germinate and to basically take over the entire site. Um, so that was something that we, we learned the hard way because we went in and sowed pretty much straight away after, after doing this burn. This burn was actually done in June uh, a few years ago and we went in straight away and sowed it and you could not find a square centimetre without a weed on it. So our only site preparation was burning. So to give you a, a good example of exactly what's going to happen on a lot of paddocks when it rains is, especially in the cool season weeds, they're just going to be completely covered in weeds. I'm not saying everywhere is going to be. Obviously, the, um, not everywhere will be, but a lot of places will be for sure. Uh, another example of us burning, um, we have, this is, uh, this is actually on uh, Formby Road, this one, and it ended up being really good uh, after we, we just, exactly the same thing, we burnt it, and then we went in and sowed it. We still had loads of weeds in there. So if this was to be a, a horse's paddock, uh, we probably hadn't really achieved what it was we were looking for because there were still lots of weeds. But from an environmental perspective, we did get lots of natives in there. Um, so, but from a uh, building a pasture, it was a failure really because there were just so many weeds in it. So that comes down to spraying. Um, at least one of the one of the techniques that we kind of need to use. We won't speak about specific chemicals or anything like that, but um, there are people out there that are organic and that need to use organic herbicides. Um, and the, there are plenty of those around. Uh, they require uh, spraying when everything's very small. Everything needs to be done to the label. So whatever the label says, that's kind of what you do. Um, but it's definitely a technique that is probably the most important. Doesn't matter whether we're talking organic or non-organic. Using some kind of chemical control is, is most of the time vital to be able to uh, reduce the weed seed bank um, before you get a native grassland in. This is just an example of, uh, sure it's not a pasture. Um, this is actually where there's been some, uh, a lot of trees planted. Um, but this is an example of what happens when you don't do the right thing on the site before you start working and doing your environmental stuff. If this was a native grassland, I do actually have a, a picture in a minute of a site that we were working on that looked like this essentially, but with us doing a, the right site preparation, sowing in a native grassland, then the people were able to plant in their trees and you had a native grassland that was 200 mil off the ground with the seed height. This, I know I haven't got anything in here for scale, but when, and I'm, what am I, 180 centimetres, the top of these grass seed heads in this picture were basically the top of my head. They were huge. Like they were, that, that's a lot of biomass. That's a, a huge fire hazard. It's something where if there was a plant growing down low, how on earth is that meant to survive? So that's how it survives. You go in and you have to slash it. You have to brush cut it. The management that you need to undertake is, is huge. The intensity, the, the cost if you have to pay for it, if it, unless it's you doing it yourself. But even then, do you really want to be going in there and doing that? You don't. So if you do everything the right way from the beginning, if you just went in and sowed a native grassland in there, it would be gone. It just would not work. You really need to do the site preparation. So this is with the right site preparation. Look at the native grasses. I, I, I just have a look. I can't see a weed in there. I can guarantee there is weeds. Um, not very many, but that was with the right site preparation. That was, um, it's one of those ones where it, you know, I see a couple of years of, of getting on top of the weeds. And I understand that there are so many sites you cannot do that. You cannot just go and spray out the site for a couple of years. You just can't. So there's other techniques and other ways you need to go about it, whether it be sowing in a, a cover crop. Um, but there are other ways. I don't know how if I can, I could have this slide as every second slide just to try and, you know, hit home that, that the weed control is so important. It just is. We've been doing this for years now. I mean, 
Uh, Bob Meyer, some of you might have heard of him. He's kind of the gra grassland guru in the Adelaide Hills. He has been doing this for 30 odd years. Uh, I've been doing it for about 10. And we both know and have worked out from trial and error, if you do not get on top of your weeds and control your weeds, you're in trouble. All right, seeding. So seeding after a fire, this is us. We have burnt it intentionally, so it wasn't a bushfire. It was us intentionally burning it. Uh, burnt in a cool season burn. And uh, we went in straight away and sowed it. Unfortunately, I don't have a follow-up picture for you. I couldn't find it when I was building this presentation. Um, but there is a lot of native grass in it, but there's also a lot of weed. Um, I, I would say, you know, environmentally, it's probably a little bit of a success. Um, but this was, this was years ago when we were trying to work out what to do, how we should do it. Uh, and we kind of worked out that, generally speaking, you don't just burn a site and sow it. Um, High-intensity burn may be a bit different, but a low-intensity burn that we were going for uh, just doesn't work. So this is our cedar. Um, it's, uh, we've actually engineered the seed box, uh, and it's, most seed boxes aren't able to deliver native grasses. They've, you know, they've got awns and twisty bits and things that they, they all hold each other together. If you pick them up in, two, in, in your hands and hold it up in the air, there's no flowability to it whatsoever. It just, it just all holds together. So uh, our seed box is um, specialized and the machine that it's attached to is an aerovator. So it's a turf industry machine. It's made specifically for, um, I think it's, it's a US machine and it's made for going on golf courses and like over sowing fairways and things like that. Now, the good part about that is it disturbs the soil, but it doesn't turn over the soil. So it's well, aerovator, so it, it aerovates. No, it aerates, I should say. So it's, uh, if, if, you hit, if you're on clay soil and you touch the ground and you can't even get your finger five mil in, after we've run our machine over it, even after the roller at the back has squashed it back down again, you can put your fingers into the ground to about 100 mil. So you can imagine after, uh, if you've got a whole heap of weed seed in there, and you've just broken up the ground and the, you know, the seeds are all in there, not only the natives, but the weeds and the weeds are just going to absolutely thrive because you've given them oxygen. You've given them lots of moisture from the rain penetrating that you've probably given them a bit of light to um, and bang away they go. So getting on top of the weeds is really important, but our, our, we've proven we keep working on our machine all the time to make it better and better. And I don't think we can make it better. The only thing we could do is make it bigger. And we are going to work on that. Um, here we go is a different method. So we've got, I know it looks a little bit, a bit, a bit homemade, but we were trying to do our best to be able to go through this solar farm uh, to try and make the harrows go underneath, obviously, the panels there. Very difficult, but the concept here is the fact of just breaking up the ground with these diamond point harrows. Uh, and uh, it, it did the job. We have a native grassland in there now, um, which is fantastic. Here's a different set of harrows that uh, are really good again. Um, this particular site, not that it's really important to this presentation, but this particular site, the again, it was one that was burnt and burnt only. So again, we put a lot of seed in there. We've got some natives in there, but what ended up happening was the, the exotic species took off because we didn't do anything about the weed seed in the soil. So here's the other way to do it using rakes you can use um, rakes are better than hose and things like that um, what we've got is the rake in the top of the screen there that you can see we've actually cut out every second uh, prong so that you're not actually grabbing as much soil you're actually just sort of scratching into it and you go backwards and forwards breaking up the soil you throw out the seed and then you you rake it again and um, the fire rake at the bottom is really good for getting in and around so if, you're, if you already have some native grasses or you've got some bare spots and uh, the, gr the grasses are growing, but you've got some seed in your, in your hand and you scratch up these little areas, throw down the seed, scratch it up again, and you can actually stamp it down with the flat part of the end uh, of the rake. It's a really effective way to, to, uh, to hand seed. Uh, he, here we're actually, it's another way of hand seeding. It's a, 
on the end of that, I know it's a little bit hard to see. Um, notice that we're using all the right PPE um, and everybody should to avoid injury. Um, so that is actually like a cultivator on the end of like a whippersnipper. Um, the concept is exactly the same as using a rake. It's the same thing, but it just was a lot less work and the area was reasonable size. And so it was just much easier to use a, um, a petrol powered cultivator, um, which essentially was just breaking up the soil. We hand cast out the soil, which is just throwing it out, give it a nice even coverage. And then we run the machine over it again, just to sort of mix it up within the top five, 10 mil. Hand seeding, there we go. So as you can see here, these, these people in Iowa, um, I would put pictures of myself hand seeding, but I can't really set the camera up that far away and take a photo. Um, that's my excuse anyway. Uh, so we do do plenty of hand sewing, probably not in a paddock like this. Uh, it's usually where you can't get your machinery in, um, but it is effective. It really is. Um, you wouldn't just throw it out because that'd be a waste of seed. You would need to run harrows or do some sort of soil disturbance um, after throwing it out. Rollers. So you don't have to roll it afterwards, but rolling it, see so that you can see our machine there again, it has a roller on the back. It is really good to be able to press the seed into the soil. So the, our machine breaks up the soil, you know, sort of fluffs it up, and then the seed drops on top of it, and then the roller squashes it all flat. Now, it's, it's just, it's really good to be able to roll it because it presses it in, it kind of beds it in, and that roller on the, uh, top left there is available from Bunnings and I think they're about $130. You fill it with water uh, and it gives you, yeah, really good for um, any hand sewing that we do, we roll it down with the, uh, with those rollers. Okay, so increasing your, the extent of your existing native grasses, manage the weeds. So we've covered that, you've got to manage your weeds. Now, if, it, if you need help on managing weeds, um, you can speak to your agronomist, you can speak to me, um, there's lots of people you can speak to, um, but managing them for natives, you really need to speak to somebody that knows that knows natives and knows natives, native systems. So seeding natives, that's what we're here for. And so don't forget that, little plug. Um, hand harvest seed. So I mean, sure you can go and buy it, but why can't you just go and uh, I suppose you have to know where the natives are first. And I'm certainly not saying go and take natives from the national park or anything. I'm saying have a look on your property or your friend's property or your neighbor's property, obviously with their permission. Um, finding out where the native grasses are and just hand harvest it when they're ready, which when they're ready is when they're starting to drop on the ground really. If you gently run your hand through the seed head and it falls off in your hand, generally speaking, that means they're ready. So hand harvest the, the seed. Sure, go and buy it if you need to. You rake the bare ground with those rakes that we were just talking about, breaking up the soil. You wanna throw out the seed onto the broken up soil, rake it again so that it's sort of getting incorporated. You know, there's so much seed that can be taken by birds, mice, ants. You'd, you'd be uh, amazed at how much could be taken. So getting it into the soil uh, is pretty important. Um, yeah, very important. So to settle in the seed, um, like what we've already spoken about, you can roll it, which is you know basically what we do. You can walk over it if it's an area where you can just wear your flat shoes and and just walk over it and then and squash it in. I've done it. We we do, we've done it. Like you know, if if you can't get a roller in there or it's a small area around existing grasses, existing tusks of grass that you've scratched in, the only way you can do that is walk over it, or you can water it or if the heavens open up at the right time, that then it gets watered from above. And manage the weeds. We keep coming back to the weeds because like, I'm not joking, it is 95% of, of uh, getting the native grasslands to work, getting a native pasture to work. It's all about the weeds and getting rid of them or managing them. So successful native grass seeding. So, the appropriate site, I know we've, we're just talking about this and we've, it's kind of like, you know how they say, you should say something, say it again and then say it again. So just making sure that people, um, or your message gets across. So my message of successful native grass seeding. So your appropriate site preparation, removing the weeds, 
and reducing the weed seed in the, um, in the soil. Sourcing the appropriate seed. So you're not going to go and buy uh, a cool, uh, um, uh, native grass, grasses that are made for damp areas. You're not going to go and buy those and put them in the mid north. Or you're not going to go and buy some seed that's been harvested from Cape Jervis and stick them in in Manum. Like so, you really need to kind of get the right species. Um, provenance is an issue. It's something that people talk about uh, mainly to do with flowering plants, trees, shrubs, and things like that. It's not the same thing with native grasses to the same extent. Uh, so I'm not going to go into provenance, but um, yes. It's not the same. You can actually use native grasses from a further afield than you would with other species that you're talking about provenance. Get good seed to soil contact to maximise germination. There are some species that might germinate in mid-air as long as they're damp and they've got some sun. You know, there are you know, some grains, as long as they get moisture, they will send a root out. doesn't matter whether they're on soil or not. But natives, natives definitely prefer and to get, you know, to be successful with your native grasslands and get maximum germination and establishment, you want good seed soil contact. Um, so that the roller helps with that as well, or the, the rain that beds it in. Don't bury the seed too deep. So if you do bury it too deep, you're actually probably going to lose it. Um, some species can find their way up. Some species can't. They, they, if they're too deep, they just won't germinate. Uh, and essentially you would have lost it. Um, if you let too much, I've covered this, if you don't let too much, if you let it sit on the surface, it can be predated, um, blown away. Uh, we had one site where we, we were um, put out all this seed. I think it was about a hectare and 20 kilos of seed and then the wind whipped up and so much of it, um, because this was back in our early days, trying to work out how things worked, how to get seeding done properly um, with minimal machinery and a lot of it just blew away. We still ended up with some grasses there, but we did lose quite a lot too. So follow up weed control is, is vital as well. So even if you've done fantastic weed control in your site preparation, there is no way in the world you can remove all of the weeds. Often there is up to 20,000, at, at minimum 20,000 weed seeds per square meter. Like that's just insane. And there have actually been um, estimates of well and above 100,000. So that's from people actually working, literally working out how many seeds are there and then multiplying it out. So this is really important. This is something I haven't really spoken about yet, but it is so important. So you can get your grassland there. You can get it all happening. You can get it all germinating and establishing. But what's the point in that if if you manage the paddock with the animals, that is what you need to do. Don't manage the animals with the paddock. So I probably went into that a bit wrong, but what you need to do when you're um, managing a native grassland or any grassland at all, but native grassland, you're putting the money and the effort and so much effort into getting it right. And the key is manage the paddock with your animals. So when you see what needs to be done, that's what when your animals go and do it. You don't manage the animals with your paddock. So you don't have your animals going, oh, they're hungry, I'll put them out there, even though there's nothing there to, for them to eat. Or, oh, it looks like there is something there, but it's really beyond the level. You should not be grazing. So it doesn't matter what animal it is. It could be kangaroos, it could be the sheep, it could be cattle, it could be horses. It really doesn't make any difference. You just need to manage the paddock with the animals. So see that the paddock and the grass and everything is your primary focus. Because you can, I know you don't want to, but you can put the horses or the sheep or whatever, you can put them somewhere else. You can plot them up or you can put them in a sacrifice paddock or whatever, just so that you can actually do the very best you can for your fantastic native grass paddock. If that, it's easy. Okay, it might not seem that easy, but it is. It really is. And yep, again, we can help you. So managing native grasslands. I'm back to that again. Um, I won't really cover that again because, you know, we're, we're still on that. You have to do this. This is It doesn't matter whether you're a grazier, whether you're a, a, a horse, um, you've got racehorses or whether you've got the pony that you ride on the weekend. 
It really doesn't matter. You can have bunny rabbits. You really have to manage the land with the animals. You don't manage the animals with the land. Okay. You've got to gauge the grazing or what's happening in your particular paddock. You have to gauge it by gauge it by the worst area, the the spot that they the and they being the animals, um, the part they're eating the most. So sure, they've gone and got the ice cream first. So whatever tastes the best, um, they are going to go to those areas first, and they are going to eat those areas down. You have to gauge the entire paddock by that unless you can fence off with an electric or however else you can do it. If you can't segment your animals out of the area that they've grazed too low, you need to take them out of the entire paddock. Sure, the rest of the paddock might look like they need, there's plenty of grazing there, but you're just gonna lose half of your paddock because you want them to graze the other side, but they don't wanna graze there. So you really need to gauge it by the worst areas or the heaviest grazed parts of the paddock. And, I, and you, you think that doesn't, you just, how do you do that? And uh, smaller paddock sizes probably helps. Okay, so grazing the tussocks no lower than 50 mil high. So if you see tussocks, you see native grasses or any grasses growing flat to the ground and they start flowering out sideways, it's not good. They're, they're, they're struggling, they're not having fun. And you really want to do the best you can for your tussocks. You want the, the grasses to be happy. Um, sure, we want our animals to be happy as well, but for them to be happy, the grasses have to be happy. So you need to leave, you know, even when the, with a ride-on mower. A lot of ride-on mowers don't even get to 50 mil. They'll be actually lower than 50 mil. So when you're slashing, if you are slashing, it doesn't matter what you're doing, it has to be above 50 mil or no lower than 50. Um, so, you know, all of these things uh, require most of the time require people altering their management and we're happy to talk to you about those things um, controlling the weeds again you know we're back to the old, same old thing resting paddocks to allow full recovery so what full recovery means so you've got let's say you've got a plant that a grass that would normally grow to 150 mil high or 100 mil high you've grazed it back down to 50 you want it to get back to 100 or 150 uh, before you put um, before you put grazing on again, I can't say exactly how that how long that's going to be. It'll depend on where you are. It'll depend on the species. It'll depend on it can be from one property to the next that might look exactly the same. It can vary. It really can absolutely vary. Even a paddock on the same property can vary to the next paddock. Um, it might be a couple of months. It might be seven or eight months. You do, we just you just don't know. Um, it's it's site specific. So allowing the seeds to drop their seed, the grasses to drop their seed, you need to build a seed soil bank. Um, you've got to get the seed in the soil. You've got to have it so that in the event that a fire does come along, you've got so much native seed in that soil that what's going to come back, sure, there will be some weeds, but there's that much native grass seed in there that it's just going to power on and come back. Um, you need to allow for... Uh, sure, the, the native grasses are perennial and they do last for a long time, um, many, 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 many years. Um, but you need to have, uh, it's almost like a contingency plan. You've got the, all this seed in there so that when there's a gap, the right time another um, seedling comes up. So that's very important. And never set stock. Never put an animal, it, it really doesn't matter what animal, they will always pick the grasses that are the ice cream, they'll always pick what they like the best and every single day they will go over to those spots. And if you go over to the native grasses too often and trim them off, all it takes is a couple of times that when they get too low and you can lose that grass and it's gone. And then they, oh, they've lost that one, so then they pick the next one and then the next one. And then before you know it, you've only got weeds growing and you wonder what's happened. Yet it looks like there's, there's plenty of grass and stuff in there for them to eat but it's just the fact that they've taken the cream. They've taken the, the best stuff first and they've actually taken it out of the system. All right, so management. Um, you know, we've got lots of different ways of managing, whether it, it could be slashing. I'm not a huge fan of slashing um, because the, the material 
lands on top, it increases the, it smothers um, seedlings, it uh, smothers the, the tussocks and natives don't really don't like that. Um, it also increases the nutrition in the soil and natives, natives are fine with, you know, with um, um, nutrients. Um, a lot of people seem to think that native grasses can't handle nutrients. They can, they grow and they're fine. You know, phosphorus might be a bit different, but they can grow in a high, highly fertile area. The problem is the exotic species, all the introduced species, all these annual grasses and these broadleaf weeds, they all like it more. They like it more than the natives. So, and they thrive and they power on and the competition for the natives is way too much. And they end up, the natives end up not being the dominating force in your paddock. It ends up being the uh, exotic species. But here we go. This is a, our uh, herbicide wiper. You set it to whatever height it is that you want and you go through your paddock and wipe out um, whatever it is that you're aiming for. So we do a lot of Cape Tulip um, and it's fantastic for that. In this paddock, we were aiming for the ryegrass uh, and anything else that wasn't, um, wasn't native. You can actually see all the little, very little things down in the foreground are actually the natives. But then the darker green, um, in the as you move through the the foreground to the middle, uh, that's ryegrass. So that's what's happened. Two weeks later, um, the natives again look in the foreground and look down low, and you can actually see all the smaller natives and all the ryegrass. I have um, I have wiped it out, uh, and which allows the natives to grow and to come through. So this paddock is four hectares and it's in Cromer, um, Cromer Conservation Park. And today it still is a native grassland dominated by natives. Um, sure, we do have Yorkshire fog, which is the bane of my existence. Um, but uh, we do have some weeds. You still have some Cape weed coming through wherever there's a gap. Um, but we spent quite, a, we spent, oh, what was it? Two or three years in site preparation on this site before sowing the natives. Um, if this was a horse paddock, the horses would love it because it is predominantly native grasses, um, just with yeah, the odd patch of other grasses here and there. So the benefits of native grasses, so you, you probably know the nutritional benefits because they're good for horses. So you could really leave it at that, but I'm not going to. Uh, they have the evolution, because of evolution and living here, growing up here, <laughs> good way to put it, um, evolving here in Australia, um, they have put up with a harsh environment. Um, yeah, so, and then also we have a variety of species that can thrive in different seasons. Most of the species that you have uh, in the paddock at the moment, most people have, thrive in the cooler season. As soon as it gets to summer, they don't thrive. Whereas the native species, you have a, a broad range of species and they thrive in different seasons. Um, Basically, the, the root systems on perennial grasses, and most of the native grasses are perennial. You've got a huge depth to, into the soil. They hold the soil together, um, and also they um, reduce the um, nutrient loss in the soil as well. Huge deep root systems. Um, high stress and disease resistance. They are able to survive here. That, what they don't like is competition from introduced species, um, and potentially diseases and things that are introduced. But generally speaking, they handle um, being here in Australia because of evolving uh, here, they, they handle it much, much better than any other introduced species. Even though annuals uh, seem to thrive, every year they come back bigger and badder than ever, but they're only annual, they die. They don't actually do any benefits to the soil. Um, legum legumes are a bit different, but we won't worry about that for now. Um, shallow soils, acidic, difficult to grow soils. We have many times we put native grasses into areas where nothing grew before. The only thing that grew in there was a little bit of marshmallow or something. Um, if you manage your native grasses, like how I was talking before about your grazing and um, letting your seed drop and getting to the soil, you will never have to re-sow again. Um, it will reseeding itself. It's 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 dropping the seeds going in there. One important thing though is having enough variety in your species so that you don't just rely on one species or two species. You put in as many as you possibly can. 
uh, and then you've got a huge variety of growing seasons and you know you have one year that is benefits one type of growing system and then that one thrives but then the next year it's a different season and a different species thrives happens all the time almost all are perennial so they all have always are alive always have the root systems growing instead of annuals where they die every year um, fantastic in low input systems you don't have to fertilize you don't have to do um, they're no good in a high input system if you have a high input system where like a dairy farm you're not going to use native grasses you're just not but we don't want to put horses on dairy pasture obviously otherwise we'll be losing our horses left right and center um, integrated pest management so this just comes down to managing your weeds in a way that isn't just one way you, you need to look at it from a whole heap of different angles you might be walking through your paddock and pulling out your marshmallow you might be wiping your phalaris that comes through you might be potentially spot spraying something else um, you just need to look at it from all different angles um, not just not just one biodiversity so to some of you biodiversity and conservation might be a huge thing for others it might not be but if we're looking at the pasture as being a part of an ecosystem which it is biodiversity and conservation value is so important whether you whether you personally value it or not it just is because uh, it's part of the bigger system uh, and it is very important um, the species that you choose can be tailored to your site and requirements so you um, yeah really leave it at that that if depending on where you are will depend on what species you choose uh, it's not as simple as going to the uh, going to the potter store and saying I want um, a pasture and they'll say here buy this and it doesn't really matter where you live here here's a pasture native grasses you would tailor it specifically to um, to your site and it would be completely different if it was in Murray Bridge compared to if it was um, down on the Adelaide Plains or um, anywhere else that's a high rainfall area shortcomings so here there's a few things I have mentioned these they're slower to establish than exotic species they won't power on like the exotics do they are slower they can't compete in their establishment phase they you know once they're a, an existing living tussock they can out compete a lot of the annual species because you're actually crowding them the, the annuals out but when it comes to growing and establishing and from a seedling into a, a mature species you, you, they just cannot compete they can't they, they don't have the ability they're just so much slower the availability of seed so we grow our seed specifically for sowing for projects we don't sell it um, because if we sold seed to everybody then we wouldn't have seed to sow uh, and that's kind of what we do um, we specialize in ecological reconstruction and um, now that is including native pastures um, but generally speaking uh, we have to have our seed available so we can't just sell it otherwise it'd be gone in like two or three phone calls people would just buy the lot um, diversity of species mix um, depending on where you are if you um, call up a native seed supplier um, and it's going to cost you this much for this species and that much for that species and you know it ends up being difficult to get a high diversity mix with us it's not because we grow a high diversity and we supply a high diversity but before us and we've only been publicly available for three years um, you couldn't get unless you went and harvested it yourself you couldn't get a high diversity cost of seed native grass seed is expensive uh, if you go and buy uh, what was it Coxfoot I think it was around four hundred odd dollars for 25 kilos um, if you go and have a look on the native seeds website uh, there in Victoria the wallaby grass at the moment is um, around 600 kilos that's uh, 600 kilos 600 dollars a kilo um, some of the kangaroo grass is if you just get the seeds it's around a thousand dollars a kilo you know that's when you're looking at putting in anywhere between 10 and 20 kilos a hectare we're talking about a lot of seed a lot of cost a lot of seed and a lot of cost so it is expensive um, we don't charge that much because we grow it and it usually ends up being uh it i'm not going to bring other the competition into it here but it ends up being a lot more cost effective for us to supply seed and to sell it for people 
uh, knowledge of site preparation requirements. Like I've spoken to you about the general site preparation requirements, which is reducing your weed seed. And if I could just sit here for 20 minutes going, reduce your weed seed, reduce your weed seed, kill your weeds, kill your weeds, kill your weeds, I'd, you'd probably go nuts and you'd turn it off. Um, but it, it is so important. Um, and a lot of people don't understand how important it is and they don't know how to do it. Um, I've given you an insight into it and if you need any more help, for sure, give us a call, give us an email. Um, the ability to seed the native species. If you're going to seed 20 hectares or something like that, how do you get it out? So obviously we've conquered that with our machine, but you can do it. You can do it with um, harrows and there's a range of ways to do it. But um, yeah, that's just something that uh, over time, people, some people have been successful and a lot of people have had failure. The knowledge of management requirements. Um, the biggest thing is not only knowing it, but being able to implement it. That's one of the hardest parts is for people to actually put it into practice and manage their property in a way that um, actually benefits the native grasses. Okay, so yeah, I look, I can't, I, as you can see, I can't stress it enough. Now, this is a picture of us uh, sowing at a site that has been prepared. Um, there are certain areas that we're seeding with native grasses and certain areas that were just being planted with tube stock. But here it is, that's our native grassland coming up. Um, coming up fantastically. We actually, on the left hand side of the picture there, you can see uh, it looks like soil in the width of about two to three meters that travels around the outside of the grassland. We actually sowed that with, as you can see there, uh, a range of tree species. So same seeder, same machine, and we, instead of seeding in traditionally like people do with, in rows, we've gone and just used our machine and then just wherever the seed lands is where the grass grows. Um, and that's, the same as the grassland there right next to it. Uh, you've probably got a few weeds in there, but that is a really clean native grassland. The only thing grazing this is uh, kangaroos. Weed control. Okay, so this is um, just a, an example of growing seed. You can actually, not necessarily to the same scale as what we do, but you can get a handful of seed, grow it in even in a pot out the back, and then when the seedlings start growing up, you can translocate those seedlings into, into the ground, into a little patch. You can have some weed mat that you've laid out, pinned it down, burn little holes in it, and actually grow the grasses. And you would be amazed at how much seed you can actually get from a lot of these, these species. Um, over the span of five, 10 years, I know that's a long time, but you can end up with many, many, many kilos of seed just from a very small area. Um, our, our scale of seed production isn't that big, but we end up with a ton of seed every year, um, if not more. Uh, and it's, it's feasible for anybody to do it. Your scale will depend on your property uh, and on what you can do on your property and what, you know, you could have a, a 10 or 20 pots that you had native grasses in that you were harvesting, uh, harvesting from. So there's many different ways to do it. You're only limited really by your imagination and your ability to water it as well. Uh, this is another seed production. This is what I'm talking about with weed mat. Um, the native grasses grow, they drop their seed, and you can actually just pick up, sweep up, or suck up the seed from the weed mat. You don't have to be there um, to take it, you know, to pick it up uh, off the plant. If the weed mat wasn't there, you can't let it drop on the ground and then go and start picking it up because you're picking up weeds. And you probably can, but we can't because we'd be selling weeds. But this scale, this size of, is way too big for somebody's property for them to do themselves. But you can do this. You can go to the hardware store or Bunnings and buy yourself a small piece of weed mat and you can actually turn that into your own little seed production in the veggie garden or next to the veggie garden or in the corner of the paddock or, you know, anywhere. Anybody can do this. It's not hard. Thank you. Um, I basically, um, I realised that this was in response to the Cuddy Creek fire. Uh, and everything I have said here is relative to fire recovery. It's also totally relevant to anything to do with native grasslands, whether it be establishment management. Um, it's all relevant. So I hope you've got something out of it um, and I haven't bored you too much. Um, and yeah, so if there's any questions that people have got, um, 
definitely put them through on the question and answer and we'll answer them. But in the future, if even if tomorrow you wake up and you're like, but hang on a minute, you can always contact me. Julie's got my um, contact details. You can find us on the internet, on our website. We've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, so seeing natives and yeah, contact us and I'm happy to answer your questions.